Um, I would like to start by thanking the people who've done the work, um, specifically Dr. Matt Perrick, he's a postdoc in my lab, about to start his own lab soon, um, and other members of my lab. I'd like to thank our experimental collaborators, uh, specifically in the Carl Dizeroth lab, um, Tyler Benster and Aaron Andelman, whose experiments I'm going to be talking about today. I would also like to thank my funding sources uh, for their faith in our ideas. So there's a couple of research questions that are of interest to my group. I begin like this specifically in a workshop because in, um, as, as, as Gauta just said, it's in the spirit of you know, fostering more discussions and feedback. So in the theme of multi-purpose neural network models, one of the properties of the biological brain that is often overlooked by traditional ML and AI models is, is a key functionality of the biological brain, which is to be able to track which which task is currently occurring and when it's time to switch. So if I were, you know, still an engineer and uh, built, you know, machine learning models for an engineering application, my goal may perhaps be to build the smallest possible network that can do the most tasks. I'm a biologist uh, more these days, so I'm more interested in exploiting a key functionality of the biological brain, which is this property of state tracking. So, you know, we're capable of doing many tasks while these tasks are occurring, who is tracking which task is being currently performed and when it's time to switch. Whoever is a state tracker has to have a couple of features, right? And to get it to those features, I build neural network models that can do many things, not surprisingly, but they're typically constrained by behavior data that are collected from animals as they're learning or as they're doing multiple different things and so on. And then my, the theory that we're, my lab is working on right now is what if the state tracker isn't a specific module, but it's a pattern of, of dynamics produced by the brain. So the one key feature that such a state tracker needs to have so as to allow multi-purpose functionality is that it has to have steady representation during the performance of A task, and it has to be able to switch at switch points. So a couple of dynamical features that have this property are fixed points or persistent patterns of activity, and also sequences, which are time varying sort of wave like patterns that go through um, go through various nervous systems. So the, the reason the, the motivation for this theory came about because we can see fixed points and sequences in many different parts of the brain, in many different task contexts, independent of anatomy, sometimes even the actual species. So the theory we have is what if these, these representations are not doing what we think they're doing, which is mediating the specific computation underlying these tasks, but merely ta tracking task engagements and switch points. So that's sort of one uh, big research program in my lab. Uh, the other research program kind of builds on this one a little bit because modularity seems to be a key determinant of, of um, at least one of the key determinants of multipurpose functionality in, in neural network models. And that is the question of why are there even multiple brain regions? How do multiple brain regions interact to produce cohesive behavior? And you can see this from the perspective of the first question that I laid out, because you can imagine imagine that the state tracker could be a specialized module um, whose job it is to track task engagements and switch. And to get at the second problem, which is modularity, essentially, multiple brain regions interacting, competing, gating signals, all of those particular features, I build multi-region recurrent neural network models that are constrained by neural dynamics data or recordings and imaging data from experimental systems. And this is what Gauche attempted to, um, to, to allude to to in my um, in the introduction that he that he gave me and then the idea with both of these models about these classes of models that my lab builds is to infer quantities and mechanisms that are not accessible from measurements alone so today i want to talk to you about one specific instantiation that kind of touches on both of these research programs to different degrees I've written a few papers on the subject and I'm happy to discuss any of them uh, more. So we're, you know, including from, you know, explosive advances in, um, in experimental technologies, neurotechnologies, also for specifically from places like the Allen Institute, we're in this era of recording more and more, right? So we're recording, we went from recording single neurons at a time to entire populations. Now we're doing entire populations across interacting brain regions, potentially brain-wide in some nervous systems, during the performance of different tasks. So we're in this era that is, you know, inevitable. 
So, uh, you know, usually data, for example, in this cartoon, I'm indicating neural pixel probes comes out in this, you know, high dimensional kind of multiplexed complex uh, patterns of activity. And I'm just indicating that here by means of this cartoon spike train. So one of the most common things to do with high dimensional data like that is to apply dimensionality reduction techniques and many different groups have found that you know and, and it's it, this piece is a fact is that you do dimensionality reduction and you end up with a coordinate space or a, or a, or a set of axes that are lower and and the relevant dynamics for any particular task in at least in the experimental conditions seems to occupy a lower dimensional subspace in the full possible dimensionality of the of the of the neural dynamics and that's that concept is typically referred to in the context of a neural manifold which is given by the covariance of activity of activations or activity of recorded outputs of these neurons the covariance is essentially a function of the outputs that are recorded through these explosive um, experimental neurotechnologies that i alluded to but one thing that the neural manifold idea does not capture is what are the inputs that are driving this covariance? So if you look at brain-wide activity, all you have access to is the outputs that you've collected, which you can do dimensionality reduction on and analyze the, the, the properties of this manifold. But the inputs that are driving this covariance are not trivial to get at. So I don't just mean the external inputs, which you can control in these highly controlled natural sounding, but still very constrained experiments. But really the inputs, when you talk about brain regions anywhere, even V1 is uh, you know, seven synapses from the sensory periphery are interactions among brain regions. So I've indicated that in this little cartoon here, area A, B, and C, which are sort of embedded in this large, um, you know, large network that has feed forward and feedback connections. So there's a couple of quantities that are inaccessible from measurements or from current methods. And that's just as I told you, inputs to each neuron from within and across brain areas. So just by looking at recordings from area A, will I be able to tell how much of that activity resulted from interactions within A and how much of that came from indirect interactions of area A with area B and area C? The, the directionality of these interactions and the effect of common inputs. So for area A and B uh, interacting unidirectionally with area C, or is area C one of those modules that provides input to both area A and B? Or is it exactly as I have stated in my cartoon, are all three reciprocally connected to one another? And also current manifold-based methods, subspace-based methods are limited to looking at pairwise interactions between, you know, let's say two brain areas or two interacting populations. So scaling them to brain-wide interactions, especially in, in smaller nervous systems, is, is still a little bit of an intractable problem. So one of the approaches that I have taken in um, taken in, in the recent years, and my lab does as well, is to build multi-region recurrent neural network models. I like recurrent neural network models because they're mathematically convenient. There's feed forward and feedback connections, with this, which is a feature I'm borrowing from biology. And recurrence provides us with sort of intrinsic dynamics that you can use to do time varying things with. Uh, but the approach here is to build these models that are constrained directly by neural, sometimes behavioral, but neural and behavioral data. And I'm, you know, and I, today I'm going to show you one example of that. But we've actually built these types of multi region neural network models that are constrained by synthetic data for model validation purposes, for example by uh, data collected from small nervous systems where you can sample practically the entire brain. And I'm gonna show you an example of that and, and to other nervous systems as well. The mice are red in this picture because I'm looking for mouse collaboration. So I'm hoping that, um, that this talk given to the, to the Allen and EITN will spark some of those interactions. But one of the things you will notice as you go around the circle um, which is, you know, admittedly a little pretentious, is that, um, is that, you know, there's a sampling problem. When you get to larger nervous systems, you're progressively sampling less and less. Once again, if I were a literal engineer with an industrial sized budget and did not care about rainforests, then I would build a trillion parameter model and subsample from it a very small fraction. And then, you know, we would see what we find. 
What I'm here to tell you is that even if you had qualitatively similar amounts of data from these nervous systems, without mimicking the literal sampling in these nervous systems, you can still make progress um, and, and get mechanistic insight into quantities that you can't get at uh, from measurements alone. So once I build these models, I analyze them using some new methods, one of which I'm going to show you today and hopefully inspire a conversation about how to apply this to mouse data. Um, and I'm going to tell you how we infer something that you can't get at just purely experimentally, which is why you probably need to build these types of models. So one of the things that I can ask, and again, admittedly pretentious banner, is um, as a theorist, I have the luxury to sit back and look at a picture like this and ask, are there any circuit mechanisms that are conserved when you go from one nervous system to the other? And can models like mine be used to identify key divergences in, um, in this? Both aspects of the problem are interesting to me. But for today's talk, I want to constrain this problem to a small sliver, and I'm going to show you what happens um, in, in a small nervous system. But before we get to that, I want to leave you with a couple of methodological slides so we know, you know, how is it that she's going to do what she says she's going to do. So the first thing we do is to go from single module to multi-region RNNs. And that is essentially taking a single module RNN, which is a simple analog weight-based, um, firing rate-based network model, in which you know, essentially there's like two properties that govern the behavior of models like this, which is the firing rate of all the neurons and all the connections within them. And I take each one of these and I wire many of them together to produce a multi-region RNN. I'm showing you a three-region model in this case schematic here. There's an RNN A, B, and C that are wired together with inter-area projections, which can be structurally different from internal or within area projections, if you want. And that's certainly what I'm indicating in the schematic, although they don't have to be. So one of the things you can get from models like this is the ability to look under the hood and look at what types of interactions give rise to the dynamics that you observe experimentally. And so that's what that, you know, in a single region or a single module RNN, that's a single matrix in which the rows tell you all the pre or the sources and the call um, and the sorry, the columns give you the sources and the rows give you the give you the targets for the post um, post synaptic weights. Now I'm calling these directed interactions because I don't want to restrict myself to networks um, using only cellular resolution data. So we're keeping this as general as possible and we're capturing non-monosynaptic interactions as well. So it's just interactions um, and the directionality of these interactions amongst all pairs of neurons. Now in the multi-region RNN case, that has a slightly more interesting form. If I restrain the inter-area projections to be sparse or not, either way, this matrix will tell you in sub-blocks connectivity within as well as uh, across areas. So this single, almost compact mathematical object still contains the directed interactions within A, B, and C in these blocks along the diagonal that you see here, as well as interactions from B to A in the block next to it, C to A in the block next to it, and so on. Other combinations are possible as well. So I want you to keep this in your brain briefly, that this matrix tells you within and across area interactions. And we'll return to why this becomes relevant in a second. The second thing we do is to take the activity of the model units in the RNN and train it to match neural data directly. So when we begin this, everything can, in, can be initialized at zero or randomly, but of course it's a wildly unrealistic assumption. However, it's just an initial state. Once networks are trained, however, the process of training takes the output of each unit, which I'm showing you here in this irregular red trace, and I train it to match a target function that is data directed. So I'm showing you here a calcium trace, calcium fluorescence trace from one of the experimental system, but it can be spiked trains that are smoothed over. It can be electrophysiology or imaging data. And in fact, now we've extended this to ECOG data as well as mixed types of data, which is spiking and ECOG in the same system, for example. Now at every time step during the, uh, the, the learning process, the entire matrix of connectivity changes. So again, when I'm saying training algorithm, I mean literally training algorithm. I'm not saying it's a plasticity mechanism. It's in fact, clearly not. It's this trick to get networks into a state where they can produce realistic outputs. 
Okay, so we've done two things. We've taken a single module, we wired multiple of them together to make a multi-region RNN. The second thing we do is to take the activity of each unit and train it to match data directly. What does this buy you, right? What, are the, what is the end result of this? This gives you three things. One of the things is once the network is trained, it, it autonomously generates dynamics that are very similar to data. Now, this by itself is not surprising because this, these networks are very powerful. So it's only a small sized whoop. The slightly bigger win here is the fact that once trained, we can look under the hood and infer consistent directed interaction matrices via this connectivity matrix that I showed you before. Now, why is this just not the covariance? If you're fitting the activity of all of the units, then the covariance comes for free. That's kind of the boring bit in these models. What the matrix of connectivity after training gives you is stability of the full dynamical system, which means that you can use this J matrix to generate activity that is similar probabilistically to the experimental data. So you can use this as a generative model, right? So that's the win here. Now, really, the thing I'm excited about is a technique that we're now applying to a variety of nervous systems, and in fact, the preprints on, online, um, is the idea of inferring currents due to recurrence within and across areas. And that's a dot product of those first two objects. So the dot product of the matrix of connectivity with the dynamics that, you can, yeah, that are either fit from the network or recorded experimentally gives you currents due to recurrence. And that is a method that we're calling current-based decomposition. So what this tells you is you built a multi-region RNN. Here I'm showing you region A, B, and C. And once you fit this to data, let's say from three regions in, in, a, in a nervous system, you get this kind of interaction matrix that tells you the connectivity within region A, B, and C along the principal diagonal, connections from B to A over here, and connections from C to A over here. Now, the dot product of those two objects, based on how you do the sum here, based on the sum of, the, of these different blocks, can tell you the experience, say in air quotes, experience of one unit in region A, that is a result of interactions of that unit with other units in region A, and how much of that activity comes from interactions with region B, and how much of those come from interactions with region C. And since we're able to linearly decompose recorded output into, into these constituent currents, we're calling this current-based decomposition or CURD for short. So exactly as I told you, the first thing we wanna do is validate this on toy data. But before that, let me just hammer home the point one more time. So let's say you have this, uh, this, this other animal which has three interacting brain areas and you're recording activity from region A, B, and C. And I'm showing you one example units activation from a synthetic model like this. And let's say region A's output looked like this and region B's output made some, some kind of a bump and region C made a fixed point that went to another fixed point. What CURB allows you to do is to use this matrix of connectivity to decompose the activity of area A into A to A or within A currents, B to A currents, and C to A currents. The sum of these three still gives you the recorded output that you collected experimentally in the first place. But now if you look at the currents from A to A, it kind of has the same shape as the recorded output. So not that surprising. But the currents from B to A has this bump-like feature, which was absent in the recorded output. It was only present in the activity of region B, which is connected to region A through sparse interactions. But you can still tease that apart over here. And currents from C to A have this fixed point-like feature, which was again absent in region A, but present in the output of region C, which is currently invisible to you, except if you did this decomposition. So in order to do this de so in order to do this decomposition you need this matrix of connectivity which you can only get by fitting the rnn in the first place to the data which is sort of why you can't do it through pure measurements alone so what I want to show you now before I show you its application on real data is the validation of this on idealized ground truth data. But before I do that I want to ask uh, one of the organizers how I'm doing on time. So you have, what time is it now? It's, uh, oh, you have about like 20 minutes. Oh, fantastic. But okay. maybe if, uh, if you have like 15 minutes, then we have more time for questions. 
great. So I will go through the validation on ground truth data. I mean, you know, I wouldn't be showing you this if I didn't already know that it kind of worked. So, so here's, uh, here's region A, B, and C, a simulated synthetic data set. So this is what I'm going to pretend is my like animal that I've found with three interacting brain areas. Now, region A is not receiving any external inputs. It's only connected through sparse interactions to region B and region C. Region B is receiving an external input. Each neuron in region B receives one row of this external input that you see here. I'm just giving it a sequential input, starts at this time point, ends at this point. Region C receives an external input also. And that's also that, and that each, each row of this is an input to each neuron in region C. Region A does not. So the activity of these three, I'm picking the parameters so that region A's activity remains as disordered um, as possible. Region B, you can see because it's being driven by the sequential input has somewhat of a sequential feature. Region C's output has this fixed point that goes to another fixed point at this particular time. So this is the generator model. Each unit, each, um, sorry, each RNN here in these three regions has a thousand units. So now I take a randomly connected RNN with 3,000 units because I want it to fit everybody here. And I fit its activity to match the activity that is produced by the generator model. And that gives me this directed interaction matrix. Now, these models are very powerful, as I had already told you, but here's the evidence of it. You take a completely random network and you can train it to match the activity of kind of pretty much anything. So here's the activity of the models fit. So keep in mind, I did not tell the, the model, the fit model, that there are three regions. Um, keep in mind, I'm putting no sparseness in it either, which is a wildly unrealistic thing we are improving on now. But you can see that region A, B, and C's activity in the fit model reproduces what you've put in to the generator. Now, what we're able to do with curved is to decompose the activity. And here I'm showing you, um, showing you the source currents only into region A. Curved allows you to, using this matrix, decompose the activity of region A into currents from B to A, currents from A to A or within A currents, currents from B to A over here, and currents from C to A over here. Now, if you look at currents from B to A, they do have the sequential feature, which is completely absent in the outputs of region A. Currents from C to A have this feature of the, of the output of region C, which was only sparsely and indirectly influencing the outputs of region A. The sum of these three still gives you the recorded output in the first place. Now, one thing that you will see in the, in the experimental data that I show you is this idea of decomposing the activity into constituent currents get, can possibly be still used to do dimensionality reduction and, and do you know, all the state space analyses that we want to do, except now we can do those in the current space. And sometimes that can be more informative, as I'll show you in a bit. So since this is the ground truth system, we also looked at what these currents actually look like, and we found that they have a very nice correspondence, or in other words, we're able to recover the ground truth currents that we've put into the system. We've quantified it, and we've looked at the failure modes as well, um, uh, as well in the paper. So where are we going with this, right? What we want this, this uh, method curved to do is really in vivo tract tracing. What we want to be able to do with this method is to identify whether a recording is from a single area or multiple distinct areas. We want to identify if there's a dynamical difference between areas, is there a structural difference between areas, and is there a difference between the types of inputs each area receives, including casting a little bit of a doubt on what even makes an area. Where we have some success with some of these, but ultimately what we wanna be able to do is, let's say somebody gives you a grab bag of data. Will I be able to tell all these properties by using this method? So let's now see what happens if you apply this method to a nervous system. Now for convenience sake, I'm picking a nervous system that is small and you can sample a large amount of, but I'm keeping the mice red uh, for reasons that I told you before. So this, um, so this is an experiment that was performed uh, by Aaron Andelman, who was a postdoc in Carl Geisroth's lab. And this involved um, larval zebrafish for convenience of being able to you know, sample a large population at once. Um, 
he, um, so he presented larval zebrafish, which were head fixed with shocks. So these are very mild shocks that are given to this fish for a very long period of time, for about 45 minute long experiment. So when the shocks first come on, the fish whip their tails vigorously to try and evade the shock. Now they're head fixed, so they're not going anywhere. And two, the shocks are presented in an open loop manner. So again, it has no influence. The, the fish has no influence. Fish's behavior has no influence on whether or not it's getting shocked. So eventually the fish give up. So after some time of the shocks being presented to the fish, they perceive it as inescapable and persistent stress and go into the state of not swimming anymore called passive coping. Now active coping and passive coping can also be thought as the network or the brain of the larval zebra fish operating under two different task conditions. Active coping and passive coping as behaviors are both adaptive behaviors. It's not like learned helplessness is automatically a maladaptive state. Every organism that we know of will respond to persistent and uh, inescapable stress by going into this passive coping-like state, except when somebody has a, has a um, predisposition to something like clinical depression, the onset point of passive coping might be more advanced or, um, or, or sensitivity might be tuned differently to lapsing into passive coping. So this is the, the effect of active coping and passive coping um, quantified. And I'm, I'm showing you here the speed of the tail whips as a function of time. The pink bar that you see here is the duration of the stress. In black is the control fish and in blue is shocked fish. These are averaged over five different individuals. And you can see these two phases playing out clearly here. Initially, the shocks coming on and this elevation in the, in the responses of the fish, followed by eventually after enough shocks building up, the shock fish's tail uh, whip response going down much below that of the control fish. Now the Dizeroth lab has also imaged practically the entire brain of the larval zebra fish with nuclear localized GCAM. And so we know that each ROI is actually a neuron over a long period of time or, or through the entire experiment. So the question here is, how do you get at something that looks like a mechanism from this data set, which has 40,000 units or 40,000 neurons over a 45 minute long experiment combined with this behavior? This is where, uh, this is where you know, we, we come in. So the idea here would be to extract mechanisms and principles from smaller brains, such as the larval zebrafish, where you have much more access, and see if the same principles are present in larger nervous systems, such as those in mice, where a lot of studies have also shown active coping and passive coping as distinct behavioral states, but we have much less access. So the homology to the mouse system is an important determinant for theorists like me who want to look at unifying principles across different species. And in specific, we want to look at Habenula and Raffae as two nuclei that are present in both systems. So here's something that they knew from measurements alone that they didn't need the theorist for, right? So there's a two main neural findings that came out of just the measurements. One is that during the process of this persistent inescapable stress, habenular activity seems to ramp up. And that's true of both nuclei of the habenula. So in blue is the shocked fish and, in, um, and in, in black here is the delta F over F of the control fish, again, averaged over five individuals. And you can see that the, at the dashed line, which is the time at which the shocks start to come on, there's a ramp that you see in the average activation of the habenula. Concomitantly with that, they see a depression in the activity of the raffae, which you can see also here in this trace. The raffae is known to be downstream of the habenula. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to identify a third node. So what we wanted to end up doing was to say, let's say the habenula is the integrator of the stress. And let's say once the stress builds up to a certain threshold, it projects to the raffae, whose job it is to dump serotonin into the system. So let's say that happens also, but the shocks keep coming in the experiment because it didn't matter what the fish did, right? The shocks were delivered open loop. In that case, we have to find something in the larval zebrafish brain that was responsible for saying enough stress has accumulated. Now I have to keep from going into shock and shut down the movement. So somebody in there had to be tracking the various epochs of this transition. So we were looking for a multi-purpose state tracker like cortex in the larval zebrafish system. And to get at that, what I'm gonna show you is that we built a whole brain network model, which I'm gonna take you through slowly. 
the right hand part of the slide was supposed to appear gently. So my apologies that it just kind of flashed on. So out of the whole brain, we picked, so I'm gonna show you three regions out of the total nine. Some, in some fish, we have as many as 13 regions. So I'm gonna show you three so we can really look at the component currents and identify whether or not we could see a single region like that, or was it a more distributed phenomenon? So I'm gonna build a three region RNN here, an area A, which is in blue, habenula-like, and area C, which is a raffi-like unit. I already told you those two were important. And we also picked a third region that stood for a telencephalon or an area B. So exactly as I showed you before, we built three mutually interconnected RNNs, area B, area C, and area A, corresponding to the telencephalon, habenula, and the raffi. And this is where they actually appear in the fish. Now, not surprisingly, once you build this network and train it to match data directly from the habenula, raffi, and the telencephalon, this exercise works. So here's a few example neurons that you see in the middle column. I'm showing you a single habenula-like RNN unit, a raffi-like RNN unit in red, and a telencephalon-like RNN unit in yellow. The data that inspired this network or was used as target function for this network is in gray in all these cases. And you can kind of see that, you know, it gets the dynamics right. These networks fit extraordinarily well, but they miss these high frequency bits and bounds. Now to show you that we haven't, I'm not just cherry picking three of the best fit neurons, we can also do state space analysis by doing dimensionality reduction on this network. And that's what you see here on the right. In red is the model's output, in black is the data. And you know, you kind of get most of the features, you get you know, most of the principal components um, as well. And so you get the overall dynamics and we weren't worried about the super high frequency bits because first of all, it's calcium imaging data. And two, the behavior transitions between active coping and passive coping that we were interested in were unfolding over several minutes, actually several tens of minutes. So we were more interested in those types of slow dynamics than we were in fitting every little bit and bound. So one of the things I promised you already were able to do in these networks once you fit them to activity is to look under the hood and look at these directed interactions. And that's what, you sh that's what I'm about to show you here. So this gives you an entire connectivity matrix, right? So the simplest thing I can do with a connectivity matrix is to plot a histogram. So what I'm showing you here is a log probability density of this entire three region networks um, matrix of directed interactions as a function of the interaction weight. And I'm taking a log scale of the y-axis because the ranges were kind of enormous. I'm also normalizing everybody. So they start at, um, start at the histogram start at one to give our eye something to look at, but I could have easily skipped that and it would have made no difference. So here, uh, the, here in gray is the control fish and in blue is the shock fish. Already there's a couple of features that drop out of this. Now the initial random condition, for those of you who study random networks and like that or have before, the original initial condition would be a very small inverted U shape right in the middle of it. So already, even by fitting a control fish, which is experiencing no shock, there's a huge expansion in range. So what used to start out as a Gaussian distribution now becomes exponential. Rather than being governed at random, Network tuning in both the control fish and the shark fish seems to come from very few, very large synapses, which is an indication, which is what this sort of heavy tailed distribution tells you. So yes, this is interesting, but really this matrix is able to now tell you connections within and across regions. And so that's what I'm gonna show you next. So we are looking at habenula and raffae because historically we wanted to understand what the mechanisms were that underlay the, the experimental observations of habenular hyperactivation and a suppression in the raffae. So let's look at those submatrices here. Not surprisingly, the biggest changes that you saw in the histogram before did come from the habenula. So you do see this within habenular connectivity in the shocked fish in blue does have an expansion in range compared to that of the control fish. Now, if I look at habenula to raffae projections and within raffae projections, I'm not that impressed. I can maybe hallucinate that the within raffae connections are a little less, um, are a little weaker, maybe because the blue is thinner than the, and the white, but you know, statistically it wasn't that great. But the thing that was surprising was this unexpected projection from the raffae back into the habenula. 
Now in the fish, there's no anatomical connection going back from the raphe into the habenula, but maybe what we're picking up is this indirect interaction coming from the fact that raphe just dumped a bunch of serotonin into the system, or there's some indication that there might be an indirect pathway that does have some feedback of the action or the fruitfulness or fruitlessness of the fish's actions back into the habenula. So this was kind of this unexpected interaction that was that was spat out by the network, which we wouldn't have known to look for in any other example. So now the Dizeroth lab is trying to test this prediction directly by inhibiting the raphe to habenula projections. Um, or maybe like removing the inhibition from the raphe at all and seeing what kind of effect it has on the dynamics and the behavior. Now, as I promised you earlier, really the thing that I wanted to drive home today and inspire collaborations with the mouse people in the audience here is that we're now able to look at currents due to interactions, right? So let's look at the experience of these habenula neurons as a result of interactions within the habenula, as well as connections from the raphe, uh, from the raphe, as well as from the uh, from the telencephalon, and doing the curd exercise decomposes the activity of the habenula into three sub matrices, and that's what these currents are showing you here. There's 2,200 habenula neurons as a function of time, but that output got decomposed into three such matrices. And I've just sorted the first one as a function of time and used that indexing because I was sick of looking at, at, at staticky pictures, but the sorting here is completely meaningless. What I want to tell you is that the sum of these three still gives you the output that was recorded experimentally, but the, but the fact that we could extract this matrix now lets us decompose this into component currents. So essentially that gave you one within area current by just looking at the dot product appropriately and a pair of inter area currents in the three region case that is a raphe to habenula current and the telencephalon to habenula current. Now taken together, it still, um, it, it result, it, the sum of these three still gives you the activity recorded at the habenula. And what I'm about to show you is that this viewpoint is much more informative than just sorting outputs into sequences, even though I've done that before, or looking at trial average or average across population ramps like this and correlating them with transitions in behavior. So one of the things we can do with this, uh, with this current-based view is to do state space analysis. So now all I'm showing you here is doing PCA on these three matrices and taking the dominant principal component. And since they're produced by non-interacting sub-matrices, they come out orthogonal. And that's what this axis gives you here. So habenula to habenula in blue, raphe to habenula in red, and telencephalon to habenula in yellow. Now you can take the output recorded and project it into this coordinate space. Now that's what the gray trace is. Now, in addition, I'm taking the times at which the shocks were presented to this particular fish and putting them onto this trajectory. Now, if you recall two slides ago, remember what we were going to do. We were looking for something that was responsible for the ramp that the experimentalists saw within the habenula. In fact, what we see here is that the early part of the experiment or the early shocks, or in other words, active coping, mostly involved rotations in the raphe to habenula subspace. And it's only afterwards that the habenula to habenula and telencephalon to habenula subspace get involved. So it suddenly showed us that there's this timing effect to the inter-area currents that was not apparent from the outputs at all. In fact, our original model of driving everything from within the habenula turned out to be completely wrong. So what we're about to do is to show you how looking at currents is a much more powerful alternative to just looking at outputs and correlating them with behavior, sorting experimental outputs, trial averaging them or averaging population activity, or in fact, if you take the activity of the habenula and project it into the dominant principal components, you get squiggles in state space, but those squiggles are harder to interpret. Here, the axes are actually given by the component currents. So when I say there's a timing effect run by the raphe to habenula current, which is responsible for active coping, you know exactly what axis to look at and how to interpret it. So it's at least a good and viable complement to these other points of view. 
So now I'm going to show you the same exact currents as a function of time. And here I'm showing you these currents as a function of time. And in black is the actual output of the tail. So every time the tail uh, whips in the fish, it breaks a light beam that gives you a vector of ones and zeros, which I'm convolving with a Gaussian, again, to give our eye something to look at. So here's a control fish. There's no shocks. In red is the Raffae to Habenula current. Blue is Habenula to Habenula current. And yellow is Telencephalon to Habenula current. And as you can see, all three sort of mirror one another. In a shocked fish, however, the picture is dramatically different. So here again, you see the activity as a function of time. In black is the actual behavior. And you can see here that early on, it's the raffe to habenula current that ramps up. And it's only later, after the fish lapses into passivity, as you can see from the tail movement ceasing and going to zero, that the habenula to habenula and telencephalon to habenula currents start to ramp. Surprisingly for us, this effect was also preserved when averaged over five different individuals. So this, uh, this effect of the control fish currents kind of mimicking one another, but then the shot in the shocked fish, the early part of the, of the, or the active coping being mediated by rotations in the current space given by the Raffae to Habenula subspace, and only later that the other two currents coming on is consistent across multiple different individuals. Now to really drive home the point that there are two different things happening here, I wanna go back to the directed interaction matrix. Now here I'm gonna show you the same log probability density graph as a function of time for the Raffae to Habenula current, right? The Raffae to Habenula current, remember, is the one that drives active coping by engaging or ramping up early. Now here I'm showing you three histograms. In black is the baseline period. In red is the early part of the shocks and blue is the later part of the shocks or post-passive coping. Now when the Raffae to Habenula current ramps up like in the bottom plot, there's no appreciable change in the directed interactions. As you can see, the black and the red are identical. It's only later on after the fish has lapsed into passivity, then there's a change in the, in the connectivity observed in the Raffae to Habenula subspace as given by the stronger interactions in the blue histogram relative to either the red or the black. So in conclusion, when we look at behavioral transitions, such as from the active coping, sort of, uh, let's say an RNN functioning in the active coping task to an RNN functioning in the passive coping task, we've made a few observations. One of which is that habenular interactions strengthen, and, and we discovered this feedback interactions from the raffe into the habenula, which we published a couple of years ago. Now, with this advent of this new method curved, we're able to disambiguate differential roles of the raffe and telencephalon projections into the habenula. And we're able to say that these behavioral transitions over long periods of time may be driven by fast rotations to the current manifold and then much slower structural changes. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for your kind attention. Uh, my lab for doing all of the work, our experimental collaborators for this long and fruitful um, collaborative work and, um, and funding sources for their faith in our ideas.